Hi folks. Have you ever wondered how compost is made? And I don't mean in your back garden or your allotment, we all know how to make kind of green waste compost with greens and browns at a local scale. But I'm talking about like factories, you know, factories that make compost, put it into bags and then ship it around to garden centers and shops. How do they, like, what are the ingredients? You know, one of the things about compost that's a bit weird is that if you look on the back of a bag of most compost, there's no real ingredients list. You know, there's no recipe. They don't really even often tell you what's inside, what's gone in the bag. But I reached out to the folks at Silvergrove at Melcourt and asked if I could come for a tour. And they, to my, <laughs> my great surprise, said, sure, we'd love to have you. So today we're gonna talk about exactly how Silver Grow is made. We're gonna talk about some of the product recommendations, why it's a little bit different from kind of green waste compost or peat-based compost. We're gonna talk a little bit about the environmental concerns and credentials of Silver Grow and lots of other stuff. I really hope you enjoy. I should say as well, quick disclaimer up front, uh, Melcourt haven't paid for this video at all. This is not sponsored. They just were kind enough to host me on the day. I've made this video all off the back of my own interest. They've not given us any free stuff and we just went along. We started the day with a presentation. I was able to like, bombard them with questions. It was fascinating. Uh, I took Jessie from Plot 37 with me. I invited her along because I know she's a big fan as well. So that was really, really nice. And then the second part of the day, we kind of had a tour of the production facility and it was it's just so cool. It's like a real life episode of how it's made. You know, <laughs> it's just like, I absolutely loved it. So let's get into the recipe. What actually goes into Silver Grow? There's four key ingredients in Silver Grow. And the first one is bark. They call it bark fines and it's basically a byproduct of the forestry industry. When they're chipping and stripping the bark, it's kind of broken down. And when they sieve it through, you get all these different grades of bark. And one of the key ingredients is the bark fines. So that the smallest stuff, I think it's 10 mil and smaller is a key constituent. And originally, way back when in the 80s, when Melcourt first started, that was their key thing. They would have a lot of bark product and all the fines they wanted to get rid of. Because if you want landscaping bark, you want nice big chips, big pretty chips for landscaping. Not all the fine, crumbly, tatty, small stuff. And they would actually used to, they used to sell those fines to peat companies who were making compost. It's been a compost ingredient for a really long time. And the second ingredient is their kind of trademarked, slightly secret thing that they call silver fiber. Basically what that is, is sawdust and more bark fines, but composted at a very specific secret ratio. But they put those two together and apparently it was an accident when it first happened. They just had a big <laughs> dump basically of all the fine screen bark that they didn't want. They chucked a load of sawdust in, it started cooking and it turned into a lovely crumbly compost. And they thought, hang on a minute, we... <laughs> We don't want to bin this, maybe we can do something with it and sell it. And over the years it's evolved into what we now see as silver grow. So you've got the silver fiber, which is the composted stuff. And then that's mixed in again with some of the bark finds. I'll talk a little bit about that more, more later. And then the third main ingredient is coir. I'd say main, it's about 15% I think in the bag is coir, so coconut coir. And I know coconut coir has a lot of detractors. We'll talk a bit about environmental considerations as we go on. But this is kind of the key sponge element. It's kind of what gives it that peat replacement texture because the coir has an amazing absorbency, basically. When I was talking about my chili potting recently, I spoke about how I've taken vermiculite out of the mix because there's a fair amount of coir in silver grow, which is really what holds on to the water. And it does give it this just amazing, lovely texture. When we were kind of feeling the coir and all the different mixes as we were going around, it was just um, this lovely pillowy, soft texture to it that seedlings love, you know, seedlings just love that. And the fourth thing is osmocote. Um, so that's a, a fertilizer that they buy in, basically. It's produced off site and they add it in at quite a small ratio. And they only started adding it a few years ago. And uh, it's the stuff, they're just tiny, clear little, <laughs> Clear little pellets, basically, and there was a, a video a long time ago where I thought they were slug eggs, which Melkor did enjoy reminding me of during the tour. <laughs> but they said, they did say, which did make me feel better, they've had like an email about that every week since they added them back in. So a lot of people do mistake them for slug eggs because they're just these clear little things. But that's like a, a, a slow release liquid fertilizer that gets mixed in there. And they did say one other kind of small ingredient that they use is a bit of nitrogen, like urea, that they use in that silver fiber composting process. Sometimes if, if it's going a little bit slowly, then a little bit of urea can really kickstart the chemical 
reaction. Anyone who does a lot of home composting and is really up on things will be familiar with that kind of extra burst of nitrogen to get things cooking. Now something I found really interesting, the reason that they have to mix the silver fiber back in with more of the bark fines is actually to prevent everything cooking in the bag. What they really don't want to happen is for all of the ingredients to go into this bag and then get up to 60, 70 degrees Celsius because you lose a lot of the nutrients. Um, there's a lot of kind of careful thought and testing that's gone into this product. And there was a video that Simplify Gardening did, which I'll link up here. If you've not seen it, it's fantastic. He buys a load of, uh, he just goes to a shop, buys I think 10 or 12 bags of compost, rips them all open, does a bit of testing. And one of the things that seemed to have happened a lot in those products is that they'd begun composting in the bag, you know, hot composting, and it's really not good for your mix. There's nothing wrong with hot composting, you know, if you're doing it at home, it's controlled. You, you have control over the process and what's going in. And a lot of the things that you put into a bagged compost, you don't want hot composting. So that's why Silver Grey add in the bark fines again to basically stop that composting process when you mix it all in with the coir and that kind of stuff, which I just, just thought was quite cool. Now, one of the, the things that really sets Silver Grey apart, and it's the thing that a lot of YouTubers and people who use it talk about, is the consistency. And the consistency of what you get in the bag is consistent because their recipe is consistent, because their supply is consistent, right? Because it's from forestry products, all of that is really planned. You know, the forestry extractions, the relationships that they've got with the timber extractors, all that kind of stuff is planned years and years in advance. So they know they can get a set amount of bark finds. They know they can make a set amount of silver fiber. And the coir is that's one that they have less control over, you know, because you have to import it. They get it from India. We'll talk about that a little bit later. One thing we did talk about is other compost companies. You know, I said, what, who do you recommend of all your competitors? Uh, and they were very magnanimous. You know, they said it's very difficult game. It's very, very difficult to make a high quality compost when you've not got complete reliability in your ingredients. So they were saying a lot of other compost companies, they can't follow one recipe because they don't know if all of those ingredients are gonna be available when they need it. You know, they might have 10 different recipes, they might have five, but that's why you can quite often go to a shop and one year the compost you buy from the same company is gonna be very different from the compost that you get the next. And it's that lack of reliability that just drives so many of us insane because it's like a roll of the dice, you know? And if you go and buy four or five bags of compost that you think is good, and then it's just rubbish, or it doesn't suit, uh, you know, what you were expecting it to be like, what you were expecting to plant into it, it feels like you've thrown your money away. And so that's really one of the things for me that sets Silver Grow apart. It helps that it's a fantastic medium, but the main thing is the reliability. The fact that I know every year I can get hold of one of those bags, and it's gonna be the same every year i love it they do as well i was quite surprised by this they have like a, a lab on site in like in their factory uh, they do a lot of testing of like uh, electrical conductivity ec and ph and that kind of stuff you know they test a lot of the batches before it goes out the recipe is pretty consistent but they're like we still want to test everything all the time to make sure they're a relatively small scale producer right like they're not a big big producer it's quite a high price point and they're not doing it at scale. They've got one production facility, which over the last nine years apparently has doubled in what they're outputting. And you can see it when you go there, like everything is just like the efficiency is dialed up, you know, like there's not really any wasted space. You could see it was so busy. There was so much traffic moving around. It was all very much kind of, it looked like they were getting as much as they possibly could from that space. Not only do they do the on-site testing, they also have an external lab consultant that they use. It's a lab in Bracknell, whose name I've forgotten, it's up here. <laughs> but they do like a really super deep dive into all the lab results and everything that's in the bags of Silver Grove. So there's a lot of testing. They did say they had one little wobble that they were quite honest about. And they said during uh, C19, you know, when it first kind of kicked off, the, the, the demand went through the roof and for the first time, they started trying to mess with the recipe a little bit, you know, seeing if they could get stuff out the door. And they did admit they thought that the quality slipped and they closed their books, basically. And so this kind of, this small site has been geared to produce as much as it possibly can, but still with all those safeguards. And I did, of course, ask them about expansion. You know, I said, oh, are you gonna buy another site? Are you gonna double your silver grow output? Um, and they kind of said that it's not in their immediate plans. And although they're on the smaller scale, you know, they're not like Westland or something like that. They're not like a massive name. 
They kind of like having a relatively small batch approach, nice secure ingredients, and like a nice sustainable business that they've got going on. One of the things that surprised me the most about this trip, right? Um, so Melkor kind of have peat free as like the keystone of their, their selling point. So their, their tagline actually on the brochure, Melkor, peat free since 83. That's their little tagline, it's quite good. Um, I, I, and I was expecting them to be like anti-peat evangelists, you know, like we hate peat, peat is the devil, you know, you should never use peat, here's why our products are amazing. And they really aren't like that at all actually. I was <laughs> really shocked. Um, one of the things is they, they recognize the struggle to get peat free products. They know that there's been a lot of bad stuff on the market and it's really dented gardeners' confidence in those products. And they do also recognize that growing in peat-free mediums can be a little bit different from peat, especially if you're used to it. And they put together a useful little guideline of different of things to, to look out for. I've never really noticed the watering thing, but that's probably because pretty much since I got started gardening, I've mostly used peat-free compost just for personal preference. So maybe I'm just used to that. But the dry tops of peat-free stuff is, is interesting. I've watered these quite recently so you can't see it, but it's a really useful tip if you're growing in peat free and you're not used to it, to always use your homemade dibber and check under the surface. I was doing this just with my garlic the other day, the polytunnel, because you do find the top seems to dry out a little bit more, but actually that's great for weed suppression. It means that weed seed that lands on your compost isn't gonna germinate. The last little point on there I thought was quite interesting. They said they genuinely want to know if something's gone wrong, you know, if they have a bad batch or a bad bag, they want to hear from customers if it has gone wrong. So bear that in mind, especially if you've gone out and bought some Silver Grove because of this video. If you're not satisfied, get in touch. I said just now that the thing that surprised me the most was their attitude to peat and scratch that actually, because the thing that surprised me the most was another one of their peat-free growing tips, which was to buy less compost. <laughs> When he said this, I was like, what? What do you mean by less? Surely that's not a message that you want to be putting out there, is it? And he said, actually, yes, it is. Because one of the problems that they get is people do big bulk orders of this stuff because it's a bit pricey, a bit exclusive. It can be difficult to get hold of as well. So people tend to do a big bulk order. I'm slightly guilty of some of these things that he went on to talk about. And what happens is you don't use it all that season. Maybe it gets left, maybe it gets dumped in your back garden in the rain, maybe it gets waterlogged, maybe all the nutrients leach out. <laughs> he was saying all this stuff and I was there like, mm -hmm, who would do that? <laughs> who would be foolish enough, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily a problem that's exclusive to peat free stuff, but it is something that they know about Silver Grove. After a year, it's definitely just not gonna be as good. It's still okay, I know that because I've used, you know, when I've, <laughs> if I've bought compost, I'm gonna use it. I'm not gonna bin it, am I? Um, <laughs> so I know it's still okay, but it's not as good. And some of the complaints that they've had is actually from people who are using compost that's been in a bag for two years. So buy less, buy what you need. Very surprising. That's a pretty good summary, I think, of how it's made. Some of the production uh, bits that I found really interesting and some tips on how to use it. But this, for me, we're now getting into the meat of the discussion, which is environmental credentials. And I wanna talk about this a little bit because, you know, Melkor, it advertises itself proven, safe, sustainable. It says it's a sustainable product, it's peat-free, it kind of uses that in the marketing. It's billed as good for the environment. So let's talk about it. Now I'm not out here to do any gotchas or like tabloid journalism or anything like that. There's no, it's good, it's bad. It's very complex, it's very nuanced, okay? I work, uh, my career is kind of in the environmental sector and this is the sort of stuff I'm really interested in. So I'm gonna try not to go down too many rabbit holes. <laughs> we might go on a few little meanders, I promise. I'll try and keep it relatively tight, but the first thing that struck me, really, actually, visiting the factory, and I was just like, oh my God. One of the first bits that we saw on the tour was just rows and rows and rows. Pallets of a plastic wrapped product. You know, every small bag is wrapped in plastic. And then all of that then gets a big extra coating of plastic. And we're used to kind of seeing the plastic of the compost bag. We know plastic isn't great. But when you see it on that scale, I was just like, whoa. That is a lot of plastic, you know, and you're selling yourself as like a, an environmental beneficial kind of product. How do you deal with that? What do you do? They were very honest and they said, look, this is a product 
it's gonna have environmental impacts, it's gonna have environmental costs. And the best thing you can do from an environmental point of view is not to buy the product. Don't buy something that's shipped from the factory to stores. Don't buy something that has ingredients that are shipped all over the country and from India. Don't buy something wrapped in plastic to grow your seedlings. Use your own food waste to make your own compost to grow your own food. In an ideal world, we'll all do that. I think we all try. I'm not very good at making compost. I like to have reliable seedlings, you know? This is like my main hobby. And there is an environmental cost to buying compost. There's an environmental cost to gardening. There's a big debate at the moment about whether or not growing your own food is actually better for the environment. It's very nuanced. The article's written about it. Also, instead of focusing on environmental costs, look at one thing in this instance, carbon. And they say, if it's bad for carbon, then it's bad for the environment. And the environment is a lot more than just the carbon cost. We're going. We're going on one of our little meanders, okay? But my point is, it's very nuanced. Consumption has a cost. Is SilverGrow going to be a better product for the environment than a comparable product? I think that's really the key and the interesting question. And a quick point on the plastic. They do use 20% recycled plastic. Their plastic bags are recyclable. They're trying to move towards 50%, but they said it can be really brittle, especially in winter. And obviously, if you've got brittle plastic that breaks when you move it, your product's spilling everywhere. Pretty useless. Oh, and as well, they do operate the only compost bag for life scheme, which I've ever seen before, which is quite cool. My local nursery Maggie's in Ferrum, they do the bag for life thing. So next time we get silver ground, I'm definitely investing in some of the bags for life. You pay like a deposit, you take the same, you, you know what a bag for life is. Now, Koya being a main ingredient in, sil in silver grow is kind of like, uh, the easiest bit to attack, I guess. Um, and to be honest, I'll hold my hand up. Not done much research about Koya. I learned a lot on the day. And it's not something I claim to be an expert in. It's not something I've delved into in particular detail. They did say at Silver Grow, like they know where it comes from. They've been out to the coconut plantations in India. That's where they get it from. Um, one of the key things that you see a lot with Koya is people saying that there's a massive salt buildup that it causes but that's from coastal coconuts. You don't get that inland with inland plantations. The koya is a byproduct of other industries, other local industries, so it's a kind of waste product. They do have to wash it, but apparently they use monsoon rainwater. It's quite a natural process, not super resource intensive. But the main thing, and the main kind of fair thing to attack about koya, I think, is the transport cost, you know, and the transport emissions of burning fuel to take it from India to the UK. But the kind of balancing is that you can compress it and then inflate it to around five times the size when it gets to the UK. So from that point of view, it's actually really weight efficient and space efficient to transport. If it wasn't, then I don't think it would be used as an ingredient because it would be too expensive. Peat is very similar in that regard, actually. You can dry and compress peat and then move it around very easily. And actually one of the things about peat is a lot of production facilities for peat ingredients were very close to the extraction sites. So sometimes if you were doing environmental accounting, peat could score quite high. And talking of environmental accounting, I'll put a little bit up here about the responsible sourcing scheme. And at first, I'll be honest, I thought it was a bit greenwashy. I thought there was probably not that much to it. But they went into great detail about the methodology of environmental accounting that this scheme uses. And actually, I was quite impressed about how much detail it went into on a lot of issues. And Silvergroat, when you put it through that metric, does generally score a B. You can go on the website and basically check all the different composts and see how they score. And I do think it's quite a useful way of getting a rough idea of whether or not your compost is environmentally friendly or not with the caveat of what I said earlier about the very nature of consumption. Now, this next part of the video is meant to be all about peat, about the impact of harvesting peat for horticulture, about the peat ban that's coming up 2024 this year, I think anyway, it has moved a lot, and why silver grow being peat free is, is so kind of important. But what's happened is I have gone down an absolute rabbit hole. It was a can of worms and I have spent days and days reading and researching about it. And in fact, it's just too much. I've got over 20 minutes of video on it. So I think what I'm going to do is split that into a different video. And one thing that I was a little bit unhappy about when I came to edit this video is I couldn't do any filming on the day, mainly because of noise and, and that kind of thing. So we couldn't really film much at the factory. Do go and watch Jesse's video on it if you want to see a little bit more behind the scenes at the factory. It's fantastic. I'll link that 
in the description. But one thing that hasn't really come across in this video so far is just how much fun I had and how awesome it was to just see all of it come together. You know, when you've, when you've been using a product for quite a long time and you become quite attached to it, just seeing what goes on behind the scenes is just incredible. So I hope you've got a little bit of that from this video today. If you've got any questions, please do ask me in the comments below. An extra special thank you to all of my Chili Peppeteer patrons, Tony, Bill, Pam, Louise, Mel, Michael, Denise, Socks in the Garden, Andrew and Sarah. You really do help to make these videos possible. Thank you ever so much for watching. Hopefully I'll see you again in the next one.